Good morning. Good morning. Today is Septuagesima Sunday. I don't blame you if you have no idea what I'm talking about. But even though we are not yet in the season of Lent, we're already looking forward towards Easter. So Septuagesima is Latin for 70 days. And so it's kind of like how if you were driving to Salt Lake City and you were still in Wyoming and you give thanks to God when you finally see the Salt Lake, you know, whatever, 300 mile marker, because at least you know you're kind of getting close. So for the next three Sundays of the church year, even though we're not in Lent yet, it's kind of like the ship is turning towards Lent. So that is why, for example, the color of the pyramids has gotten darker from white in Epiphany and Christmas to green. And it's also why we are numbering the Sundays according to how far we are from Easter. For the service, we're going to be following right one, and we'll begin with the opening prayer. O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray you to open our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that through the preaching of your word, we may be taught to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. We sing hymn 13. Please rise. Let us bow before the Lord and confess our sins. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most, most merciful God, you have given your only begotten Son to die for us. Have mercy upon us, and for his sake, 
grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Upon this, your confession, by the authority of God and of my holy office, I declare to you the gracious forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May he who has begun the good work in you perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Peace be with you. Amen. Glory be to God in the highest. And on earth peace, All glory be to God on high, who hath the race he The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. O Lord, we beseech you favorably to hear the prayers of your people, that we, who would be justly punished for our offenses, may be mercifully delivered by your gracious goodness for the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people. 
taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Here ends the Old Testament reading. We now continue with the arrangement of the psalm for today that you either have in the bulletin or on page 111 in the front of the hymnal. is from 1 Corinthians, chapter 9, verse 25, through chapter 10, verse 5. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest, after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Here ends the epistle. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel for this Sunday is from the 20th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, verses 1 through 16. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, 
he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. Here ends the reading of the Holy Gospel. God be praised for his glad tidings. We confess our faith according to the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we sing the first five verses of hymn 226. <laughs>
Dear workers in God's vineyard who aren't going to get what you deserve, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In the parable Jesus tells us today, the owner of a vineyard went and hired people to work for him. He went to the town square at the beginning of the day and agreed with the people he found there that if they worked for him all day long, at the end of the day, he would pay them a denarius, which at that time was a normal day's wage. But after hiring that first group of workers, the owner of the vineyard went back to the town square several more times, and each time he hired more workers. He even went back there when the day was almost over, and he hired more people to work for him. Every time the owner went and hired more people after the first group, he told them that he would pay them what was right. We would assume that this would mean he wasn't going to pay them the same as the first workers who were hired. But at the end of the day, when all the workers came and were paid, the owner paid the workers who had worked the least a denarius. He thought it was right to pay them the full amount even though they had not done all the work. He was being generous. But the workers hired first did not like this. They felt like they were being cheated, even though they were being paid the same amount they had agreed upon at the beginning of the day. In response to those complaints, the owner of the vineyard said, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? At the beginning of this parable, Jesus tells us that it's a parable about the kingdom of heaven, which is another way of describing the kingdom of God. And if you're a business owner, that's a relief. Because if this parable was meant to explain how Christian business owners have to run their businesses, there would not be any successful Christian-owned businesses. Imagine the confusion and the anger at the end of a pay period when all the full-time workers were paid the same as the high school kid who was just hired and only worked one four-hour shift. It would not take long for all the good workers to either quit and find another job or to stop coming into work on time because they know they're going to get the paid the same no matter what. Any business run like that would fall apart almost immediately. The Yelp reviews would be hilarious. And the business owner might even go to jail for violating labor laws. No, in this parable, Jesus is not explaining to Christian business owners how they have to pay their employees. There are actually other places in the Bible where business owners are given guidance for that. But this guidance doesn't just apply to Christians. It applies to unbelievers just as much. For example, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, St. Paul writes that if someone is not willing to work, well, they also are not going to eat. A wise business owner won't pay their employees by grace. They'll pay their employees by works. But the kingdom of God isn't a business. And God does not take care of the people who are part of his kingdom in the same way that a business owner in this world pays their employees. For starters, it's important that we understand how we can become part of God's kingdom. It's not the same as if we were looking for a job, because if you need a job, you'll probably do research online, or you'll see we're hiring signs in businesses around town, and you'll decide where to apply. But no one applies to be part of God's kingdom. To be part of God's kingdom means to believe in Jesus and be saved. But that's not something that we have the ability to choose for ourselves. The third article of the Apostles' Creed has to do with the person and work of the Holy Spirit. In the explanation to the third article in the Catechism, we confess what the Holy Spirit does and also what we are not able to do. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, Believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Ghost has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. 
just as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings us into God's kingdom. Through the gospel, the Holy Spirit gives us faith and he makes us holy in God's sight through the forgiveness of sins. And we also see this in the parable Jesus tells us. Because for all the workers who went into the vineyard, what was it that brought them there? Whether they went and worked at the very beginning of the day or not until the day was almost over, the thing which brought them into the vineyard was the owner of the vineyard going and calling them to work for him. And the same is true for us in the kingdom of God. We're only able to be part of God's kingdom through faith in Jesus, by God the Holy Spirit, calling us to believe in Jesus and giving us that faith. And once someone has been made part of God's kingdom, what does God give them? Well, we know what God gives us. He continues to forgive our sins. He comforts us and he promises us eternal life. But why? Why does God give and promise these things? Well, it's not because of any work that we do for God. Because if you want to know what your work as a sinner is able to earn for you from God, then look no further than what St. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6. The wages of sin is death. God doesn't make any good promises to those who trust in themselves and their own works. The only thing that you as a sinner can earn for yourself is death. But keep on listening to St. Paul there. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's important that we understand the difference between a wage and a gift to understand why God blesses us in our lives. A wage is something you earn. A wage is given to you because you deserve it. But a gift isn't given to you because you deserve it. A gift is given to you because someone else who has earned that gift wants to bless you with it. The forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life are not something you can earn. Those gifts have to be given to you, which they are freely. But before those gifts were given, they did have to be earned by someone. And the wages that you have earned had to be received by someone. For his entire life, Jesus never sinned. In everything he did and said, Jesus always did what God's word says is the right thing to do. But at the end of his life, instead of demanding that he be given what he deserved, Jesus cashed your paycheck instead. He carried your sins and your guilt with him to the cross where he died in your place. That is how the gift God gives to you freely was earned. And when Jesus rose back to life on the third day, God declared to the entire world that in Jesus he is gracious and merciful, and he offers forgiveness and life to everyone through the gospel. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So God doesn't demand that you work for his gifts. He doesn't say that you have to labor in his vineyard to earn your place there and be saved. But this doesn't mean that God doesn't give you work to do in your life as a Christian in his kingdom. St. Paul also writes in Ephesians chapter 2, By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In Jesus, by his blood, which was shed for you on the cross, and now has been spread onto you through the gospel and the sacraments, God hasn't only redeemed you, he has also remade you and repurposed you for the good works he has prepared for you to do. Or as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, there is a yoke for all of us to carry as we follow him in faith. 
But as we do the work that God has given us by loving and serving others in our vocations, that work is light. It doesn't weigh us down. This isn't because the work that God has given us to do in life is always easy or it's always immediately rewarding. And it's also not because the work God has given us to do doesn't matter, because it most certainly does. All the good works that God has prepared for us help someone. The reason why this work is light is because we know that our standing before God and our eternal salvation don't depend on it. The works that were done to save us have already been done by Jesus. His resurrection shows those works are enough. So instead of being fair with you, God is gracious with you. Instead of giving you what you deserve, God gives you what he wants to give you. Faith, forgiveness, and eternal life. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please rise. Let us pray for the church and for all people according to their needs. Master of the vineyard, by your Holy Spirit, you have called us into your care. You have enlightened us with your gifts in baptism, holy absolution, and the Lord's Supper. Your grace is beyond all telling. Keep us from all grumbling, from the evil of envy, and from unbelief. Give us contentment and a firm trust in you, that whatever is right and for our good, you will give us. Lord, in your mercy, hear Amen. our prayer. Master of the vineyard, send forth laborers into your harvest and sustain those whom you have sent. Keep your whole church mindful at all times of the gracious favor you have shown to us, that we in our vocations may serve you with faithful labor, especially as hearers of your saving word. Lord, in your mercy, hear Amen. our prayer. Master of the vineyard, you call us by your grace to work and live in your kingdom not as slaves, but as sons and daughters of the Most High and brothers and sisters of Christ. Work graciously by the teaching and example of fathers and mothers to preserve the faith of the children and help them to grow in it until life's end. Lord, in your mercy, hear Amen. our prayer. Master of the vineyard, you have established all authority upon earth to be a blessing and not a burden. Remember those entrusted with civil authority here and in all places, and enable them to serve with wisdom and integrity for the well-being of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear Amen. our prayer. Master of the vineyard, graciously provide for all those who are ill, grieving, or in any need, especially your child Phineas and all those whom we name in our hearts. Give them contentment to take what you send them and go their way, confident that whatever is right, you will give them, since you work all things together for the good of those called according to your purpose. By your gracious gift of Christ, relieve them of all their sorrows. Lord, in your mercy, hear our Amen. prayer. Master of the vineyard, we are entitled to nothing and deserve only judgment and punishment, but we are bold to ask for everything by grace in Christ. Grant us repentant hearts, faith in your promises, and unity of confession, that all who receive your body and blood this day may be strengthened through the forgiveness of sins for a life that abandons sin and idleness and lives in joyful service to our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our Amen. prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, through your holy word, you have called us into your vineyard. We beseech you, send us your Holy Spirit that we may labor faithfully in your vineyard, shun sin and all offense, obediently keep your word and do your will, and put our whole and only trust in your grace, which you have shown to us so abundantly. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
one true God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the offering. Please rise for the preface to Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts unto the Lord. We lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy,
Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
We continue with the hymn of thanksgiving, number 325. Please rise. Let us give thanks and pray. We thank you, Lord God Almighty, that you have refreshed us with these your salutary gifts. And we beseech you of your mercy to strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 You may be seated as we sing hymn 222, but please do stand for verse 3 of the hymn.
O Lord, we render unto you our heartfelt thanks that you have taught us what you would have us believe and do. Help us, O God, by your Holy Spirit, for the sake of Jesus Christ, to keep your word in pure hearts, that we thereby may be strengthened in faith, perfected in holiness, and comforted in life and death. Amen. You may be seated. Morning again. Morning. Morning. Just a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, we are having our mission rally on February 19th. You've heard me say it before. You will hear me say it again at least one more time. I believe there is a plan for how we're going to handle the meal that day. Debbie, would you care to speak to that? Right. So instead of signing up, go and write your words into Marsha's ears. There you go. Also, uh, the day before the mission rally on Saturday the 18th, Chris is going to be hosting a men's fellowship time at his house starting at 5 p.m. that day. If you can come, please tell him. Also, on March 8th, which is a Wednesday, we're going to be hosting a concert from the Bethany Lutheran College Band. Maybe you remember they came here about four years ago. It was in 2019, which was before Rona, which seems like a thousand years ago. But they're going to have a concert here at 7, and then the next morning they're also going to do a concert at Prince of Peace School. So, but something that we can do to help them is putting some of them up in our homes. And so there's a sign-up sheet for that, if you could sign up for two or three or four. If it's something you can't do, don't worry about it, but if it's something that you can do, Hopefully consider it, and if you have any questions about what that entails, you can ask me. Is there anything else I'm forgetting, Jim? Yes, I believe somebody's birthday is on Tuesday. And yes. I think the traditional uh, happy birthday would do. Yes, let's all help John turn red by singing happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. about John's birthday is he's turning 11. In a sermon a few weeks ago, I said he was turning, a tw he was turning 12, because for all year I thought he was 11. And no one corrected me. John just went with it. He figured, oh, I can drive a year early. So, until we meet again, may God bless and keep all of you. See you, buddy.